Good day everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Jesus, our Messiah. Uh, the name of this broadcast is Cross the Border, and I'm Nicholas, and today is a live Prophecy Reality Edition, so if you're listening live, come on over to the chat room at firstamendmentradio.net, uh, studio cams on, and uh, join the discussion. Be the first one in the chat room, in other words, or nearly the first one here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about premillennialism and amillennialism. Uh, I'm writing my new book, so I'm on this. I've been researching, and I found some things that uh, I found interesting online, and I thought I'd share them with you, and we could discuss them. It's always a uh, a time for research and looking what everyone at what everyone else is saying about a certain topic when you're writing on that topic. Uh, of course, premillennialism has everything to do with uh, Revelation chapter 20. And so let's first uh, open by taking a look at Revelation chapter 20. Okay, and it reads beginning at uh, verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now the question is, are we there yet? I don't know, Satan seems pretty active to me. But let's continue reading. According to the amillennialists, we're already there. Satan is bound. You get my meaning. It says, bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, what I see here is a parallel of what happens in Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he dreamed of an image, and this image represented the four great kingdoms that would rule the world until Christ comes and sets up his kingdom, abolishes the kingdoms where Satan rules, and in their place, his kingdom fills the whole earth. Has that happened already? The amillennial says that this thousand years is figurative for the time that the church is living in, in the present, until the second coming of Christ, when the figurative 1,000 years will come to an end. So, has Christ already come? Daniel 2 says that when the stone that was formed without hands, representing the kingdom of Christ, strikes the image, the image representing the kingdoms of this world where Satan rules, it is obliterated and becomes like the chaff of the threshing floor, and it is blown away that so, so that no place is found for them anymore. Well, I look around. We see the image is still standing. We may be in the bottom of the image. We, we may be in the ten toes of mingled iron and clay era right now, which represented the distant future from Daniel. As you know, the head of Babylon, the kingdom present, with uh, Daniel at the time was the head of Babylon. So moving into the future, you move down the image to the feet. So right now, we're in the ten toes of mingled iron and clay, which represented the distant future from Daniel, but it's definitely not blown away yet. It is still extant. It's still existing at this very hour. Let's continue that he should deceive the nations no more. Are the nations at this time still deceived? Apparently, Satan has not been bound for the alleged amillennial thousand-year period yet, so it cannot be, in my opinion. If I overlay the present and Daniel chapter 2, it cannot be the kingdom of God that is foretold to be set up upon the earth where all of the other satanic ruled nations are abolished because Satan is still present. He is deceiving the nations during what is supposed to be the amillennial thousand years. 
but not the premillennial thousand years of the literal reading of the text. Continuing on verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, this must be the same thousand years that Satan is bound and no longer deceiving the nations. And those nations, governments under the headship of Satan, have been totally obliterated. And they have been blown away like the chaff of the threshing floor, so that no place is found for them. Are we there yet? Well, looking around, I don't see us being there yet. Bear with me. Don't run away, all you amillennials out there because I think maybe I might be able to convince you. Yes, you're thinking that'll be the day. Well, stick around. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this is the first resurrection. Of course, this little phrase here is referring to what has happened in conjunction with the thousand years and those that are reigning and ruling with Christ. This is the first resurrection. The millennials will not agree with me here. But many of them will say that the first resurrection is when you're born again. Some will say it began at the appearance of Christ. Some will say that it, will, it began at the resurrection of Christ. Others will say that it was at Pentecost. You get the idea. The first resurrection was when you were born again. Well, what does the scripture really say about that? They say the first resurrection is when you're born again. You join Jesus in the first resurrection. The Revelation 20 first resurrection is symbolical, as is the thousand-year reign, they will say, for all those who are living now in the kingdom of God, because it's true, Jesus is the king of the whole earth. He's even the king of Satan, and he's the king of fallen away kingdoms, and he turns them whichever way he will. For instance, when he said, Babylon is a sword in my hand, and he used that sword in his hand to judge Israel. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Then, after he judged Israel, he judged all of the nations around Israel. He judged Babylon when the Medes and Persians came in, etc. So he's always been the king of the earth and of all things. When we consider the judgment that fell on Israel in 70 A.D., we understand that as God wielded Babylon as his sword in judgment at the first desolation and destruction of the temple, in the same way, it was Jesus, the king of kings, who wielded the Roman army, the people of the prince that shall come, which did come in 70 AD. He wielded them as his sword in judgment against national Israel for the overspreading of abominations to borrow the biblical language there. So we see no indication of any change in the temporal rule of God in the affairs of the kingdoms of men from these two desolations being nearly equal. So as to indicate an abolition of the kingdoms of men or effect of satanic deceit in them. Back to Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, there's the first death. We all understand the death sentence that we were all born with. You shall surely die, inherited from our great great-grandfather Adam. I haven't been bodily resurrected yet because my Adamic man has not suffered death. 
And we know there will only be a small elite of people that are going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, a kind of instantaneous death and resurrection. But that's a very small group of people. I hope to be among them when Christ returns at the beginning of the seventh millennium. I hope to still be alive then because, honestly, I don't know if I'll live long enough. I'm already retirement age, according to most people's standards, so I could live long enough. Some do, but most people don't live that long. But this is not our focus. No matter what era we live in, the church's focus and great hope has always been the resurrection event. Even before apostolic times, the resurrection of the dead was a focus. It was the difference between the Jewish sects, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. Paul used that division to expound upon the gospel resurrection of the dead, the point being that we all believe in the bodily resurrection. Now, the problem with the amillennial position is they have to say that the first resurrection always already happened. So they say things like, well, the first resurrection is when you're born again. That's how you can have it now in this amillennial figurative period of the church age. That the first resurrection came with Christ and everyone who is born again is born into the first resurrection. So you're living now in this amillennial figurative millennium. Of course, the thousand years or millennium is figurative for a long period of time. We're not even going to discuss that today. If you're born again, if you're truly born again, and you are a partaker of Christ's death and resurrection by faith, the second death will have no power over you because you will make the first resurrection when he returns. So there's truth there. But here's the problem. I have to say this. I'm in total agreement with the amillennial on every single point of their orthodox theological belief in the scripture. There's only one point I depart from them on, and that is the return of Christ. I believe it to be premillennial, and I believe the millennium to be an actual literal period of time. And I base my disagreement with them on the literal rendering of the word of God at chapter 20, of the Revelation. They would, however, say that I am misinterpreting the chapter and refer me back to Second Peter chapter 3 or the parables of Jesus to better understand the symbolic meaning of the text. Now, progressive revelation, since I've been studying this, is a term that I hear quite often, especially with new interpretations. Had to look into this. Progressive revelation is the principle that as time passes and more prophecy is fulfilled and verified, our understanding becomes more complete. The principle is demonstrated by New Testament historical verification of Old Testament prophecy, which was fulfilled and recorded within its pages as the fulfillment. It is the new which completes and clarifies the old, not vice versa. However, progressive revelation does not apply to extra-biblical revelation. And this I have from um, ChristianApologeticsMinistry.org or CARM.org. Progressive revelation is the teaching that God has revealed himself and his will through the scriptures with an increasing clarity as more and more of the scriptures were written. In other words, the later the writing, the more information is given. Therefore, God reveals knowledge in a progressive and increasing manner throughout the Bible from the earliest time to the later time. This makes perfect sense when we know that not everything God revealed to us was revealed right away. Now, progressive speculation, on the other hand, which is what futurism is, cannot be regarded as, nor should it be mistaken for, progressive revelation. 
because everything that differentiates that view is taking place in the future where nothing can be verified. It is very convenient for those that practice this method of eschatology, that is progressive speculation, that we have to wait for a temple, for instance, we have to wait for a temple to be built, which may or may not be built before Christ returns, to verify whether a rapture takes place or not, and if not, we have to wait three and a half or seven years for the other two rapture options to play out. How convenient it must be to have to verify nothing. All they have is conjecture by scriptures that seem to support their hypotheses. But conjecture and hypothesis alone can verify nothing. Moving on. Which text should interpret which text? Peter or the Revelation? Parables or the Revelation? Now, Tim Conway, you find him on YouTube, big proponent of amillennialism. He would have you use parables, and he loves the parable of the Ten Virgins to interpret Revelation chapter 20, which came after, rather than use the later to clarify the former and harmonize the two texts. Rick Wiles falls into the same trap. And here I have a video that I'm going to play for you. But the rapture was invented to get rid of the Christians so that the Jews could run the world. That's and to remove the Holy Spirit. Yes, remove the Holy Spirit and the church, the Christians, get them out of here so that the Jews can have control of the world for a thousand years. That's the millennium that they teach, which is not a biblical concept. I, I, look, I already read Revelation 20, all right? And you're making, you're making a, you're developing a theology that's not anywhere else in the Bible. And the, that didn't exist for 1800 years in the church. That's right. Because Apostle Peter said that the entire earth and the heavens, the universe, will melt in a fervent heat when Christ comes back. Right. If it melts when he comes back, how can it be here for a thousand years? Right. One, either St. Paul, I mean, either Apostle Peter was wrong or the Millennium Theology is wrong. Which one is it? The Millennium Theology is wrong. So the problem is not that Revelation 20 is, is incorrect. It is the interpretation of it is incorrect. And it's all built by John Nelson Darby and Cyrus Schofield and a whole bunch of, of heretics. And this stuff got into the American churches and changed their thinking. So Rick Wiles falls into the same trap. He says that the millennium is, I quote, is not a biblical concept. And other than Revelation 20, is not anywhere else in the Bible. He continues, the Apostle Peter said that the entire earth and heavens, you heard him, the entire universe will melt with a fervent heat when Christ comes back. Okay, I'm going to have to pick this up when I get back from these messages. You're listening to Cross the Border. I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? 
Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, a Prophecy Reality Edition, and we're discussing uh, premillennialism versus amillennialism. And I think I'm going to back up a little bit and play that video for you again. But the rapture was invented to get rid of the Christians so that the Jews could run the world. Right. That's and, and to remove the Holy Spirit. Yes, remove the Holy Spirit and the church, the Christians, get them out of here so that the Jews can have control of the world for a thousand years. That's the millennium that they teach, which is not a biblical concept. I, I, look, I already read Revelation 20, all right? And you're making, you're making a, you're developing a theology that's not anywhere else in the Bible. And the, that didn't exist for 1800 years in the church. That's right. Because Apostle Peter said that the entire earth and the heavens the universe will melt in a fervent heat when Christ comes back. Right. If it melts when he comes back, how can it be here for a thousand years? Right. One, either St. Paul, I mean, either Apostle Peter was wrong, or the Millennium Theology is wrong. Which one is it? The Millennium Theology is wrong. So the problem is not that... The, Revelation 20 is, is incorrect. It is, the interpretation of it is incorrect. And it's all built by John Nelson Darby and Cyrus Schofield and a whole bunch of, of heretics. And this stuff got into the American churches and changed their thinking. Okay, there you have it. Rick Wiles falls into the same trap and that is using the earlier text 
to uh, interpret the later revelation. He says that the millennium, and I quote him, is not a biblical concept, and other than Revelation 20, is not anywhere else in the Bible. He continues, the Apostle Peter said that the entire earth and heavens, the entire universe will melt with a fervent heat when Christ comes back. If it melts when he comes back, how can it be here for a thousand years? One, either Peter was wrong or the millennium theology is wrong. Which is it? The millennium theology is wrong. So the problem is not that Revelation 20 is incorrect. It is the interpretation is incorrect. It was all built by John Nelson Darby and Cyrus Schofield and a whole bunch of heretics. Well, I would ask, if the millennium is not a biblical concept, Rick, where did you get it from? You admit erroneously that other than the revelation at chapter 20, it is not anywhere else in the Bible. But you say that interpreting it as it is explicitly and literally expressed in that chapter is wrong theology. First of all, it's not theology, it's eschatology. And when you call someone a heretic for taking the Bible literally, for not agreeing with your figurative interpretation of eschatology, congratulations, you have escalated yourself to the height of the papal chair. Perhaps you were carried away in the moment and got a little careless, as did your cohort, who said that the millennial doctrine didn't exist for 1,800 years in the church. And you agreed with him. You said, right. However, the millennium is nevertheless older than the Christian church, for the belief in a period of 1,000 years at the end of time as a preliminary to the resurrection of the dead, was held in Phariseeism. The world is to exist unchanged for 6,000 years, and that at the beginning of the sabbatical or seventh millennium. Okay. And Kiliism was the predominant belief through the fourth century in the pagan Rome era church, from the first century, the church held to an imminent return of Christ, followed by his millennial reign until about the fifth century, when the Roman Empire embraced Christianity as the state religion. Kiliism is the ancient name for what today is known as premillennialism, the belief that when Jesus Christ returns, he will not execute the last judgment at once, but will first set up on earth a temporary kingdom where resurrected saints will rule with him over non-resurrected subjects for a thousand years of peace and righteousness. To say that the church rejected Kiliism may sound bizarre today, but when, when premillennialism is the best known eschatology in evangelicalism, but how are we to view the church's earliest periods up until the first decisive rejection of Kiliism in the church? By most accounts, this was the heyday of Kiliistic belief in the church. Many modern apologists for premillennialism allege that before the time of Augustine, Kiliism was the dominant, if not the universal, eschatology of the church, preserving the faith of the apostles. Some forms of Kiliism was certainly defended by such notable names as Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon in the 2nd century, and Tertullian of Carthage in the 3rd. The point is, despite what Rick and Doc have said, premillennialism has been around for all of church history. Though it was interrupted for nearly a thousand years, almost absent from the 6th to the 16th centuries. Also, premillennialism is not inseverably linked to dispensational futurism any more than is the resurrection of the dead or the second coming of Christ. Premillennialism preceded it, and I'm sure will follow it when it is left behind. To intimate that they are inseverable degrades the amillennial argument to a specious support. Now for the exposition of Rick's erroneous claim that other than Revelation 20, the millennium is not anywhere in the Bible. 
I now turn to the very proof text that he used to disprove premillennialism. 2 Peter 3, 7 through 13. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Peter opens by informing us that last day's scoffers are willingly ignorant. So I surmise that when he next tells us to be not ignorant of this one thing, that it is very important to understand that which follows. If the day in context is symbolic for a thousand years, then interpreting this rare prophecy by Peter using Revelation chapter 20 completely harmonizes the two texts together and satisfies the doctrine of progressive revelation. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. If the day of the Lord here is a thousand years day, that all of the things listed in this prophecy are not confined to a single literal day, but in reality span a thousand years. Verse 11, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. According to this text, That earthly kingdom which the Jews believed was promised, which the disciples explicitly asked Jesus about, which is plainly stated in the Revelation of John, is not an error to be rejected. All of the things listed here in 2 Peter and elsewhere in the Gospels and Epistles find their place in the chronology of the millennial reign of Christ revealed in Revelation chapter 20 the day of the Lord. We are required to harmonize that which is vague or simple with that which is more complete. We understand that which came first by that which came later, not vice versa. So what do you think? Do we interpret Revelation 20 by 2 Peter or do we interpret Second Peter by Revelation 20. Well, it's kind of a no-brainer. And plus, when you harmonize the two texts by the one which came later, everything fits. The day of the Lord is a thousand-year day. Peter explicitly expresses that as in the text itself. And we should, first of all, I guess we should, and, prob- and even the Jews, they, they, write, they found it in the Old Testament the thousand-year days. Before Christ appeared, the Pharisees believed that there were seven 1,000-year days. Peter comes along, and he confirms it. Then the revelation comes along and puts everything in its chronology, in its place, in the thousand-year day of the Lord coming to a neighborhood near you real soon. Okay, let me check the chat room, see if I have any comments or questions here. How is the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ applied to them since it is completed? Well, it's completed for us too. 
the same way it's applied to us. His blood pays for the sins of all of the sons of Adam because he is our kinsman redeemer. Those people that will be born and that will live through the return of Christ because for this all to work out as even the Jews believed before Christ came, as I see confirmed here in the scriptures, I think I've substantially proved to you there will be people that will live through the return of Christ and they will not. They will still be mortals. Okay. And they will need to be saved the same way they will need to receive the gospel and they will need to be saved. But one thing that will be demonstrated through this is that nobody at the end of it will ever be able to say if Satan wasn't loosed in the world, if Satan didn't rule the kingdoms of men, everyone would have been saved because it will be plainly demonstrated through this seventh millennium, the rule, the physical, literal, bodily rule and reign of Jesus Christ on the earth as the Jews believed it was promised to them, as even the disciples, when they said, when is your kingdom going to come? They weren't asking about an amillennial figurative kingdom. They knew what they were asking about. They knew what their religion, the Hebrew religion, the Jewish religion, expected and was expecting at that time. Only they were expecting what was going to come at the end of, they thought, they, they didn't know what the chronology was. Even in the first millennium, in the, in the, during the first 400 years of the church, many people thought they were getting to the end of the sixth millennium. That's how little they understood, how incomplete their revelation was. Now, I have a, I have a posting on my website called, um, What Year Is It? And according to that, I think we found a chronology in the Bible, and it looks like it's going to be about 2055 that the sixth millennium ends and the seventh millennium begins. I don't know the day or the hour, so don't even accuse me of that, okay? And you may say, well, figuratively, it means you don't know what you, any the year even, but it doesn't say the year. So I'm going to say, and I'm going to even admit, it may not even be the year, but it's about that year. It might be the year before, it might be the year after, it might be a three-year window, it might be a five-year window. I don't know, but I've done the best I can with the help of everyone. You'll see all the comments there on that page, what year is it at crosstheborder.org, and you'll see that it's about 2055. So we have, what, about 30-some years, oh, 30 years now, it's almost, it's a, you know... <laughs> I, I completed that, I think, in 2015, and now it's almost, it's going to be 2020 next month. So that's 30 years from now. I hope I can hang on till then. You know, I'm, I'm old, <laughs> so another 30 years, is that right? 20, no, 55, so it's 35 years. Oh, and I even have to hang on five more years. I got to live another 35 years. Well, I hope to God I can do it. And if I don't, if I don't live that long, I... I don't know if the martyrdoms are going to come. Well, let me be one of them. That's what I say. If they start beheading people for not going along with the uh, new social economic order, well, you know, this they can graduate me sooner. I won't have to wait the whole period of time. But I would rather do that or live until that time and be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and uh, then, you know, die in my bed <laughs> uh, a dude says, by then, 2055, I will be raptured. <laughs> you laugh out loud, huh? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, if you read my book, what is it called? Uh, when the Third Temple is Built, the Rapture Play Will Begin. And the inklings and the, 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 the noises coming from over in the Mideast seems like it's, you know, it's about to break on the scene at any time. Uh, and I think it will if they get, if Trump gets another term and he actually is able to get his peace plan through, I think they're going to get that built, built, that temple built. And I think that's the whole purpose of it. And so when that happens and nobody's raptured, I'm not going to say, I told you so. 
Because you know, that, you know what the rapturists are going to say when they don't get raptured and they start building the temple? Go, oh, it's mid-trib. <laughs> we got to wait three and a half years. And, uh, and then we wait four years and they don't get, and it's, oh, it's post-trib. And then we wait seven years and they don't get raptured. Eight, nine, ten years pass and they're still not raptured. See, I'm telling you, the rapture is not the resurrection. It's a deception. So do not be deceived. Yeah, I know you're kidding, dude, in the chat room. Rapture candy strikes again. And it is candy. It's very sweet. People like to think, because first they tell them this lie, that all of the calamity and all of the disaster and all of the judgment of the book of Revelation, you know, from chapter 6 through chapter, uh, you know, 18, because that's where it's all in there. It's, it's all reserved for the last seven years, the great tribulation. And you need to be raptured out of that because you don't want to be here. And God doesn't want you here either. So put your faith in the rapture, in rapture eschatology. And, uh, yeah, I thought, you know, when I, because I, I, I believed that too when I read the late great planet Earth. And I thought, oh, no, all of this stuff in seven years, I don't want to be here. Oh, yes, sir. Nobody wants to be for you for that. So the rapture candy was easy to buy. I love it. The Antichrist is always bribing people with candy and gifts. You know, Easter, Easter candy basket, basket full of candy for the get get them while they're young. Get the children with the candy and the gifts and presents. And who would want to deny them that? But all you're doing is is initiating them into a belief system that is very anti-Christ, very fake Christian. They talk about fake news. That's what anti-Christ is or anti-Christian religion is. It's fake Christianity. You know, we had the fake Christ over there in the Vatican sitting on his high chair, ruling the world, you know, behind his shadow government that works for him. He ruled the world for 1,206 years openly, you know, uh, no covert rule there. You could read all about it in history. You know, of course, they don't, since the, his shadow government controls all, all the education systems of the world, you know, all the ones that get funded by his uh, shadow government bankers <laughs> or get all of the taxes to, to fund them. Yeah. Um, nobody knows history anymore. How eye-opening history is. I, be, I love history now. Never read it before, and they taught me some history. Watered down history was that when I was in the public fool system as a child, you know, that's and the Catholics were every, you know, when you went into a public school system on your thing, your, the, the record of you, they had two little boxes there. <laughs> one said Protestant and one said Catholic. They wanted to know what you were. I mean, it was very important. You all remember, all of you who are my age or right around there and definitely older, that everywhere you went, Protestant, Catholic, and other, and then you had to explain because the others would be Islam and Jewish. And uh, be, be, beside that, there were a few others, but, but you know, it was Catholic, Protestant, other, and then they, like they had to fill it in with other, but on everything public having to do with the government, they wanted to know who you were for a very good reason. Yeah. Because the Antichrist does rule the world. That head wound has been healed. And the beast that was and is not yet is, is the way that the Roman Empire exists now. And no, the New World Order is not just a new way of doing things. The New World Order is the order that rose up in the New World. Now, it's the same players as the Old World Order, but, you know, they tried to establish the Old World Order with the League of Nations. It failed. So after World War II, after the second 30 years war in Europe, okay, the first one was way back when. The second one was World War One and World War Two. Okay, that was that was brought to you by the Antichrist and his shadow government. You know, brought to you by the Antichrist and his shadow government. This has been an Antichrist and shadow government production for your entertainment. Okay, so 
the New World Order. They failed, okay? They failed on purpose. And then the League of Nations was defunct. So they now established the New World Order. The new League of Nations is called the United Nations, and it is headquartered in the New World. Thus, it is the New World Order. Okay. Well, I've had enough fun here for today. Uh, you're listening across the border. I'm Nicholas. This has been another Prophecy Reality Edition. I really need your support really bad here at First Amendment Radio. Um, nobody's giving us holiday gifts here, <laughs> but but we need them really bad. I'm telling you, if uh, if most of the people out there listening to me had to live on what me and my family live on, uh, they'd probably have given up. But I think actually, you know, at uh, at you know. Um, in my late 60s here, <laughs> I'll put it that way, I'm too old to go back into carpentry, okay, and get out there and young and compete with all those young carpenters. So I have to do what I'm doing. And I love doing what I'm doing. It just doesn't pay very well. So if uh, we need your support at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. So if you're supporting something that's questionable, move your monthly contributions over to First Amendment Radio. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, stick around. We're going to have some more Christian history segments, so you'll want to stick around for that. But until we meet again, may the Almighty bless you and keep you. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now.